easy to be uh, um, tired. And now we have Jose Gregorio Cotua. He's from Venezuela. He lives in Chile of the Simeon uh, company. He has broad experience implementing IPv6 uh, Gitpon networks. So people in the IPv6 uh, Gitpon, uh, I recommend, I always give his name for people who want to ask questions. So thank you, Jose. Unfortunately, this time he is remotely, but I think that we can't lose this opportunity to ask him questions so that he we can clarify doubts. Jose, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me well? No. Yes, we can hear you, Jose. So good evening, everybody. I want to especially uh, agree to the people at this event, either in person or through Zoom. We, Viva Mexico. Unfortunately, I, I haven't been able to go there this time in person, but I know uh, Alejandro still invited me to talk about uh, Gipon uh, provisioning in IPv6. So, can you validate my my screen? Can you can I can you see the screen? And I'm going to start uh, talking because I know that I don't have much time. I see some uh, people that I know there, and I want uh, to thank um, everybody for coming. Unfortunately, I won't be able to take any tequila, but uh, maybe some other day. So, can you see the screen? Yes, 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 we can. So thank you. Okay, so let's talk about the IPv6 provisioning for 10 GIP GPON networks. What is it that we need to do to implement it in uh, 10 GPON. I don't want to speak to talk about GPON, but 10 GPON to uh, because we are at the time of uh, the big consumptions of uh, bandwidth and contents, and GPON is a technology that uh, enables us first uh, uh, 10 GPON and then now technology 40 and 100 GPON. So that is why I wanted to talk this provisioning of uh, GPON networks, 10 GPON networks. So basically, we'll discuss uh, a couple of things. We're going to talk for a, a few minutes of 10 GPON, and then we're going to talk about the provisioning processes. What are the protocols and the techniques that we must clearly understand? And then <coughs> what we should do to configure end to end, and that in the end, we may give IPv6 to uh, customers that are in uh, one of these networks. This is not a GPON tutorial, but we must uh, see the context of GPON as well as the technologies of 10 GPON and 40 GPON. These are technologies that were designed for the networks of access that want <coughs> to connect thousands of users using uh, fiber optic passively and with uh, very important characteristics in terms of capacity. So we, we may have points of uh, 2.5 gigabits, uh, etc. and for uh, greater speeds. And we may connect thousands of uh, um, clients. To give you an idea, we can handle uh, up to 64,000 uh, clients. This is a technology that's based on a, a technology that is known as the T in XSL is the Eastland 
And at home, so we have a CP unit that is known uh, an, an external technology that helps us uh, use uh, optimized costs. This is absolutely passive and it is, does not require any active. Uh, one, one of the most important characteristics of GPON is that in spite of the fact that it can be used in many ways, this is a versatile technology. The key word is transparency, its transition, it's allowing the uh, the uh, uh, technology, the, the, the homes uh, to be connected to the, IX, the ISP and uh, the internet that the ISP um, offers. So, in the case of uh, GPON, this is a technology that uses different lambda because the GPON technology as such multiplex uh, of the uh, wavelength to put the same in the same fiber the uh, uh, upstream and the downstream uh, and uh, connection and it can even multiplex uh, this and 10 upon that are 10 uh, download uh, um, speed we have even over the uh, traffic uh, to do um, the photometry and all this uh, the most important of GPON and the concept uh, of person cell is that uh, this allows you to transition the packets of the ISP to the layers at high speed with a great uh, tracing uh, capacity. The, 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 the ISPs may be up to 40 kilometers away, achieving speeds of up to 10 gigabits in the case of 10 uh, uh, GPON and more than 10 gigabits when there are several. Um, um, so this is technology that's here to stay, and it is what is enabling us to offer high capacity services. And today in Latin America, we are preparing uh, services of one gigabit bandwidth. Uh, so Venezuela, even in Venezuela, we have a, a ten uh, G pond, and it is affecting services with a bandwidth of uh, one or two gigabits or 500 megas. So this is a technology that is based on wavelength and traffic to ensure the download and the upload uh, traffic. The complete map of the technology is a technology that really started near the year 2000 with an EPON um, technology with for a hundred mega capacity, and, and but now it is obsolete. So, and with a capacity of 2.5 gigas per port, that is quite a lot. So those 2.5 gigabits are multiplexed for 64, etc. Uh, clients, but the GPON technology gives you three uh, gigabits to be multiplexed from one to 56 uh, clients and that so you can offer plans with very high sales programs which cannot be get uh, with the XL so you can provide very high speeds with fiber at great distances and handling many clients in very small units and in addition to that this technology in addition to have 10 and 2.5 up speeds, asymmetric speeds for corporate plans and carriers for smaller ISPs, but the standard is ready for the 40G PON technology that you can include in the same Lambda Lambda of 10 gigas or 8 gigas and 80 gigabits at 20, 40 and 80 kilometers distance. So practically, what is amazing is the capacity of this technology. 
Okay, yo creo que con eso... So I think that that is more than enough. Let us keep the key word, which is transition. This is a techno technology that will allow that CPE units, which we call the ONTs, can have access to internet services in the network in the operators in, in the operators network. This will be transparent for us, but for greater distances and bandwidth. So, what we have to say is that in some cases a GPON network can also do routing. OLT has a capacity of an IP, can route and can do DHCP and can do proxy processes, DN proxy processes, but the most common use is that the OLT is completely transparent. Now, let us speak about the processes that we have to bear in mind. What do we have to know? We must recall, and what Wesley say, and also what Alejandro said, when we provide these courses, we insist that the important thing here is the concept that you should take home. You have the key concept, then the commands and how, um, if it's a graphic interface or this command or the other command, you do end up learning this. There's a lot of documentation available. But what I insist on is that what you should take home is a concept, the clear idea, so that you have a clear picture in order to continue expanding on the deployment of IPv6. So what do we have to bear in mind? In IPv4, things happen in a given way. I think all of us are aware of the IPv4 process, where you have a CPE unit that does a routing, and that DCP routing, well, there used to be a bridge, but today, 100 CPEs do routing, and you have the client network behind. And here you have the IPv4 routing. This is a network. I'm not showing it, but this is a GPON network because it's transparent in the IP layer. And then we have the provisioning layers, the VNG, and all the control layers for the SP. So when you have IPv4, you field of action is up to here. You have to do what you do here to do the one provisioning of the interface and everything that is behind is masked because it is natted. This is the NAT 4.4 that takes place there. So typically the cloud works, works here with an IP and then I reach up to this stage what occurs behind the client is a process which is in charge of the CPE and the ISP doesn't act here beyond the CPE. And I have to focus on the process of the DHCP or PPOE or static addressing in some cases, but I go up to this stage here. Now, the point is that things change with IPv6. Now, with IPv6, the natting process, quote, does not exist, unquote, or it might, according to me, my opinion, this should not exist, and work is being done to try to go back to NAT and so on. But nevertheless, this is something that is being discussed right now. But philosophically speaking, IPv6 is born so that we don't need to suffer from the problems we had with NAT. So this has to do with processes that are connected. The CPUs change a lot, and the processing levels of the devices change a lot. So the first thing you come across with IPv6 is that you don't have NAT. This means that the ISP now and the control layer not only has to reach here, but in addition to that, it has to reach the client's network. If the client has a fridge and that fridge is going to connect to the supermarket to do an online purchase because today everything is automated and things with AI, we don't know how far we'll get, but that fridge will have to have an IPv6. And that IPv6 somehow or other is provisioned or comes from some process defined and deployed by the ISP. This could be a mobile phone, a clock, a computer. All these IP addresses will have to be global. 
there's no concept of private IP. So this imposes a new challenge. There are new challenges that have to be done. The ISP has to do some things that they didn't do in the past. But I insist this is not bad news. It's good news because I am saving, uh, I'm eliminating the NAT process. And now we have the real problem, but we also have the solution, namely to provide provisioning to the client's network. So basically what we're going to have to do is to how to do that addressing. Now, what I'm going to be sharing with you of this remaining hour is how to do addressing for this part of the client, which is IPv6 now, and can be as small as a laptop that is connected or as big as a university campus or a network of small offices of a client that are interconnected, but that doesn't matter. The thing is that we're going to do provisioning. So that's a new thing. So to sum up, the new things about IPv6 is that the ISP has to deploy a whole set of things in order to take provisioning right through to the last device in the client's network. There are there are enough mechanisms with all the security elements and automation, the appropriate, uh, uh, so that any device there may have an IPv6 version and may have access. In very practical terms, in black and white, let's divide the processes into two parts. The first is how to provision the one uh, interface, the one. Here you have it, provisioning um, in IPv6 um, for the, um, and the second is provisioning of um, the LAN interface, so one and LAN. So I have to take the provisioning there, that's the challenge. Taking that uh, provisioning is a challenge. The solution is there, and we're going to learn it today. But that challenge is due to with the fact that we should not forget, but that all the addressing uh, processes are routing process. So it's no, uh, what's the use of defining IP addresses in the client's network? It's, it's not 10 or 50 clients, it's millions for some I. ISPs, there are thousands, other millions. Think of a Chinese city with 80 million people, and each of them has a CPE device, and if there are 50 devices connected, and all of them need at least one IP, and that needs to be automatic. So it's no good to address a uh, uh, a device if I don't route it. So this, with this, the arrows, is a dual work. I have to address and to route, because I can give you an IP address and you can configure it, but if it's not routed, there's nothing you can do. So process two, this one here, that is provisioning of uh, the uh, network of the client needs to go with a routing. So that's a clear process. You should not forget that, and now I'm going to show it. So let's go on. So summarizing in IPv6, there is no private network. Uh, all uh, the addressing is global. We must um, um, assign uh, IPv6 addresses uh, to the interface, to the one interface of the CPE, and the, the idea that it it's that it should be a global address, so that is why they're assigned a slash 32, all the space of uh, IPv4 uh, multiply time slash 64, so it's 4,000 uh, million uh, slash 64. It's crazy, the number of IP addresses. So there are some criteria as to how to assign that. So uh, starting with the phase that the OLT is transparent, and here there's a switch of access that's transparent, and basically 
we will see how uh, around uh, um, uh, this is the case of uh, B. Um, um, this is the graphs, uh, and uh, through, for instance, there are, there are networks that can be very simple, others may be very complex, uh, that must provision a CPE unit and not one, but uh, millions um, uh, centralized and efficiently with a control that, uh, and in addition, with an invoice system because I need to be able to control it. So I must synchronize with the systems, with the invoice systems, and I must control the bandwidth, although the bandwidth is changing a lot because as the bandwidth is larger and larger, now there may be a time where it is no longer controlled. So this is highly controversial. So, so that, that's what we're going to do. We let's uh, have a, a very quick uh, review. I'm going to show you the methods for addressing what uh, protocols and techniques we have uh, to address the interfaces. Let's remember that the IP addresses are assigned uh, to interfaces of machines, so we have different methods. The most simple one is manual. That is, well, this, so we could draw a command, uh, and we have an interface that is configured, and that's it. But doing that in 5, 10, or 50 pieces, uh, uh, machines, it's easy, but in 10 million, and uh, delivering service in uh, less than 30 minutes is almost impossible. So there are some methods, for instance, some of them are automated, like uh, um, li, uh, link local address, uh, the gateways with, but we have mechanisms inherited uh, as a legacy from IPv4, such as DHCP, that was uh, extended to the prefixes and together with the relay that uh, you're going to see that the relay is essential and the process that allows us to auto configure one interfaces for the concepts uh, of announcing uh, prefixes that are uh, pure and then there are other schemes such as PPOE or privacy. So now let's remain with the DHCP, RA, and with the DHCP V6 relay. So we need to handle those concepts well to handle the uh, this IP6 architecture in a GPON structure. So when you configure, uh, you need to have two rounds. So the first one is IPOE that may be static or manual and automatic, and the other one is a PPPOE that requires synchronism with an ar architecture of authentication that also works. Some people like it, sometimes uh, people don't. And uh, regardless the path, we need to face the challenge that we and in the case uh, of DNA processes uh, and DRA, the, the idea is that with a computer, with an interface, with the previous configuration, goes uh, to uh, request a slash 64 prefix together with other options such as DNS, etc. And uh, it, in a, it makes it possible for the devices in that same domain to take that prefix using um, D64 or some other elements of a single address based on a prefix that may auto configure and uh, from interface one may have access to the internet and have uh, a gate to 
um, go out. So that is one of the first IPv6 uh, processes that is over 20 years old. So it would be redundant to give you any details. I think that if you are familiar with IPv6, you must be familiar with this process. Why do I mention it? Because the configuration of uh, these uh, uh, versions can be done statically, but it is not recommended. You can use RA or using DHCP. Here, there is a whole issue. The stateless uh, uh, DHCP, but sometimes the state is necessary for tracking purposes. In some countries, it needs to be like that. Uh, the law states that it needs to be like that. But we have for the one interfaces of the CPE devices understanding that this is a network of access and that this is the access router and these are the CPEs. We have mechanisms such as RA and DHCP, state, stateful and stateless for the one phase. However, an important thing, that I'm let me go back a couple of slides. One of the important things of IPv6 that sometimes goes unnoticed is that in IPv6, we don't need to give the internet to the CPE. As a matter of fact, the CPE may not have internet. What do we need to have? We need the client to have internet in its network. As a matter of fact, the networks may be blocked at least. They need uh, TR69, TR069 in the cloud. But really, what we need is for the client to navigate. So that is why um, interface one is optional. We may delete it. We do need routing because we need it for a uh, gateway. But um, in here, uh, the navigation comes from the client. And that happens because there's no NAT. As there's no NAT, the transmission comes from the client. OK. Why do we need DHCP version 6 with prefix delegation? Well, some minutes ago, I told you that we need addressing and routing the client's network. Well, the way we do that, we assign addressing to the networks, to the client's network, is that the control network sends the CPE prefixes. A pool of slash 64 prefixes. That is called delegation. So if I need to configure something that is behind you, I'm going to send you a pool of prefixes. For instance, 16 slash 64 prefixes. So that block of 16 slash 64 is known as delegated prefix. And delegated prefix is a set. It's a number um, of the prefix slash 64. There, there's a whole issue whether they are 16 or whether they are, it's enough with 16, it's 64, 32, 65,000. So I'm one of those that consider that you have to give a slash 68 or slash 64. So that is an issue. But that is the reason why we need a protocol that doesn't send addressing but prefix. That is why we need a new protocol that is called DHCP prefix delegate and the architecture with client server with a client that requests it and it comes from a pool and goes with a request, a process that is the same as DHCP, but it doesn't assign addresses but prefixes. Initially, one was given for the delegation, but I don't remember the year. The delegation has been part of the standard of DHCP version 6, so the same server that operates IPv6 gives the delegation. It's quite simple. So I want to give you an example. I'm going to devote a couple of minutes to give you an example of how delegation occurs. When you have a delegation process, the first thing you do is define a basic prefix. I'm going to explain it with an example. 
So let me open this document and show it to you. Look at this. It's three levels, um, base uh, pre prefix, delegated prefix, and uh, slash 64 prefix. For instance, I define a base uh, prefix as slash 48 as the big prefix from which I will take uh, the other pref a delegated prefix. So when somebody requests a delegated prefix, I can take one from here. So I define a slash 48 and from there I say, well, whenever I'm asked a prefix, I'm going to give a slash 56. So if I have a slash 48, remembering the bit issue, and I'm going to give one slash 56, if you subtract, it's a very simple subtraction. It's two uh, slash eight uh, to fifty-six of that slash forty-eight. You get um, uh, two hundred fifty-six a week. This is the first prefix. This is the first slash fifty-six of that slash forty-eight. This is the second. This is the third, and so on and so forth until you get to prefix 256, starting by with zero. Now I'm going to take number two, that is the third prefix. Remember that we started at zero. So I take prefix two, and that delegated prefix, in turn, has in the, the prefix slash 64, the idea is to give the CVE a slash uh, 64, but as a block. If I want to give you a slash 64, I'll give you a slash 56. That is 256 slash 64. I can assure you that when you do this, after doing this two or three times or four times, you learn it by heart. So don't get frightened. So those of you who know it, you, you may know that uh, you can learn it very quickly. And I recommend you to take a couple of tequilas or beers or wine, whatever, and you'll do a couple of exercises. And after one day, you'll learn this by heart. So the first slash 64 prefix from that delegated one would be this, and the second would be this one, and the third. So if we have a second slash 64 of the third prefix, which is slash 56 taken from the slash 48. So having understood that, here we have a table. And you might ask, well, how do I work? I work slash 48 to 56 and 56 to 60 or slash 48 to 52. So you, I prepared this table and the material will be made available. Today I learned something from Wesley. It's good to have your own QR, like Wesley did. So here, if you have a slash 48 and then a slash 60, I can delegate 4096 prefixes and each will have 16. In Jipon, this is great because everything is through Jipon. With Jipon, you have 258. And I like this formula of the slash 48 with the Jipon, or a slash 48 in the Jipon port, or the slash 36 for slash 48. And I divide this 36 and 440 and a slash 48 for each delegated prefix. So there are many, many options. Some people say, well, a slash 48 is too much for a client. I'm going to give them a slash 60. And there's a webinar out there of Alejandro Acosta, who's an expert on this. So I, what I would say is not more than a slash 48 and not less than a slash 60. If you want to have an average of slash 56, that's fine. If you wish to do this according to LACNIC's guidelines, which is not so binding, but is helpful, you can use a slash 48 for clients and it will work very well. It will harm no one. So these are the base prefixes. Here we have another example. 
this is a further explanation. So this is a recommendation made by Alejandro Acosta. It's not a great idea to have a slash 41 or slash 43 because it, it will get mixed up. So the idea is to make this as easy as possible. Now, let us now go over to the practice. I will directly go to the exercise. The, this is the topology we have, this one over here. We have an access router and the addressing request should be with triple A and B authentic, authenticated. I'm not going to touch upon that topic, but the concept is that provisioning will be done through the access router. We have an access switch. Very often, the two are the same thing. We have the OLT. The provisioning level is transferred, the GPON network, and this is a CPE. The two protagonists are the one who, who does the provisioning, which is the access router. This can be quite simple or as complex are as an MPLS network or a microwave network or whatever. But what we are concerned about is that this guy over here does provisioning to the CPE. The CPE, this is a router, and we need to guarantee that what we have over here gets all this. So let us think. Let's have a look at the parameters. Regarding the ONU, I remember I gave the first GPON courses back in 2006. And back in those times, this was quite transparent because there's no IPv6 deployment yet. And the router was behind the ONT, but from 10, 2010 onwards, the ONUs became more and more relevant, and now the ONU has everything. It includes routing and NAT, it proxy, and DNZ, Wi-Fi, several Wi-Fi ports, telephony. It's very complete. But we have to work in layer three mode. I'm not going to configure in IPv6 only. It can work in dual stack or in IPv4 only. And I'm going to go directly into the setup. Let's dedicate a couple of minutes to the setup of the ONT. When you start setting up the ONT, I entered with a link local address. And that's one of the good things that the ONTs have. Namely, it already comes with native IPv6. And then on the client side, you can enter directly. So you can set up an ONT in different ways through XMN and with many options, TR079 by commands from the OLT. Some vendors allow setting up the ONT from the ONT itself. But I'm going to use a very simple method, which is through the web, because the objective right now is not the tool, but rather to see the concept of what I have to set up within the ONT. How are we doing with time, Alejandro? We have about 20 minutes left, or 25 minutes. So can you hear me well? We can hear you. So let's go on. So web setup. We have a default user. And what I recommend is to enter through IPv6 so that you get used to this. And the first thing that you have to do, because this ONT has a possibility of working in layer two and layer three. But first of all, you have to state that you're going to work in layer three. 
these are the LAN ports, and basically you enable the checks here, stating that you're going to work in layer three. So these ports are going to be routed because the ONT will work in CPE mode. If I uncheck here, it means that port four will work on bridge mode, and that's not what I wish. So I just enable the four ports. Step one is to state that the ONT in those ports will work on routing mode. If I want to have internet in the four ports, I might have just in one and the other ones can use a television for a telephone. But right now, that is not the purpose. So the first thing that I have to do now is to set up the ONT with a WAN interface. Sometimes these are totally unconfigured, so we have to set up everything, we have to configure everything. So we create a WAN interface. I'm going to say you're going to have a WAN interface here, and this thing over here, this WAN interface, and how do you, this does this learn this rapidly? So first, it has to learn what it has to do, the concept. So that's my recommendation. So first of all, I create a WAN interface. If tomorrow you come across an ONT that never before saw this, first I have to do, configure a WAN interface. So I click on New. And here you have the parameters. It's very simple. Enable one, and then state encapsulate mode, PPOE or IPOE. I didn't do the exercise with PPOE. I could have done it, but I selected IPOE we do, to do encapsulation there. So those packets, that interface will be for IP4 traffic only, IP6 only. Dual stack. And like Alejandro Acosta said. Exhortamos. And we urge you to, if it is not possible to use IPv6 only, at least dual stack, even when G with GPON. Working with IPv6 only has serious implications, so it usually ends up being dual stack. But I'm going to do uh, IPv6 only because I won't touch uh, this uh, topic. So I say IPv6 only. It's a good idea to do a lab of IPv6 only to see how it works. It's a good uh, beginning. And so I say, well, the interface will be the router. It can be bridged. The service is internet, it's a bit of makeup. And the ONT, if you don't say that it's internet, they won't let you talk. And I'm going to say that, and this is very typical, although I can handle the uh, traffic here, it is very typical to handle the uh, traffic uh, with VLAN. So we say, well, we're going to work with VLAN. And uh, here, it's uh, the VLAN ID is 266. I can also work on the quality of service handling priority. And I'm going to say, well, you're going to route to the um, these uh, ports um, and do it transparent from LAN 1 to LAN 4. So far, this is the basic thing. And now we see IPv6. So here, in the part of IPv6, there are two things. The first is how am I going to address uh, this is this part here, uh, IP acquisition mode means how are we going to configure this uh, addressing? That line says how that address will be configured. Remember that I, there were two uh, arrows. This is one and this is the second. So this one is E. So here we can say, well, uh, so the IP acquisition mode will be the HSCP, automatic, static, none, um, and or, or none. Notice that it may be none, but it may be that it doesn't require any addressing. It, this is a good exercise. In this case, as I wanted to focus, and I want to focus on navigation, 
Now, I shouldn't do the exercise of a DHCP for one, but for the delegation. And we are going to put it automatic. You'll have to see, based on many parameters, whether you're going to do the one of a CPE and DHCP, so you should install uh, version 6 uh, server or the version flag so that you, the land that you would have to put a router. And now the second thing, it is, ah, and how are you going to address the prefixes of uh, the uh, network? So this number two is this here, this is two. So you will have the prefixes using DHCP version 6 in the client mode. So you tell the CPE how to start again and here explain it again. So now let's see the interface again. So we put IPv6, route uh, 1, 266. Let's simplify this. LAN 124, SSID 1. There are other things that are a bit more advanced, such as DS Lite, and there are some servers that allow you other things. So there I configured the route. Notice that just by configuring this one, I'm going to open the service here. I'm going to enter here to enable. Well, no, I'm going to do it at the end. I, I still have to do a couple of things. What I can achieve with that is for the CPE to get a pool of prefixes. And here I come to LAN, and here DHCP version 6 server, and I need to say, well, what IP address do you have in the LAN side? What IPv6 address am I going to put here? A very important thing here is the CPE of the LAN side does not need any uh, addressing, only an IP. So, just um, this is enough. Typically, the IP address is FE80 uh, colon colon one. So, how am I going to get the prefix using one? Which one? The one I just configured. Mask. This is the mask. Why do we speak of masks? Because as I receive a slash 56, I can tell the CPE, well, when when you receive that slash 56, that is uh, 56 slash 64, I want you to take the third. So the way you can tell it is to say, well, take four. So if I say take zero, it takes one, and if I put it here, it takes two. That is, of the 256 slash 64 that it receives, it takes fourth. So that's what it means. I insist. After two, three or four exercises, you'll learn it. Where does DNS come from? Well, the CVEs must receive DNS to provide them to the clients. So it takes from one, A1, and the DHCP also. And in words, it enables the RA. In other words, here it sends DHCP RA so that the clients can configure with what I have just said. So what have we done? We have defined a slash 48 over here. From that slash 48, we gave a slash 56 to the CPE. From that slash 56, it took one, the fourth, a slash 64, and it did RA 
and this is how I face the challenge. So that's the third step in the ONT. And there's one thing missing, which over here is the following. I'm in the LAN here, or otherwise, let me check in router. In this section on default IPv6 router, I have to state here that the CPE link is number one, so that the traffic goes to the internet through that WAN. So these are the four steps for setting up a CPE with IPv6. And one final thing, which is optional, is namely that all CPEs have a routing table. And I can add static routes. Once a student asked me about this, he said, well, I have my client's network has to correct direct, connect directly to the CPE. Well, here you can have a router and put another network here and a router here. So the client's network can be as small or as big as you wish. So the CPE helps you. You can add routes and even some PPs, IGP inwards. But at least stable routing. So let me save changes. So we now have configured the CPE, and you can do this in different ways with the graphic manager and other options. But here, I did this manually. Let me save, and we have the CPE ready. Now, let us look at the result. I'm going to do two things now. First, I'm going to show you the RA. The RA. Remember, I said I'm going to do this with RA, but you can also do it with DHCP. I'm going to do a RA here, over here in VLAN 266. I'm going to do an RA here, so addressing goes to the ONT over here. I'm going to do it rapidly with the RA. So basically, this is the Huawei router, this is 6730. So I'm going to enter the VLAN interface to 66. All the parameters are over here. Now the OLT. And here we have the OLT. Over here, you have interface two. And now, basically, that VLAN, which technically is the IP interface, the interface at the IP level, the important thing here is that you have HUA addressing. Remember this prefix over here, FFD. FF68, FFD, and these are the RA parameters, the time, lifetime, the hop limit. You can also include RA, you can send NS. So these are parameters to send the RAs. And I'm going to enable this. I do this with the command and do IPv6 and DRA and hold this command sense. It's going to start sending this. Let's go to the ONT now. And I want you to look at the status. And here at the OLT, I had this enable, I had enabled the service. Now I have disabled it. Now I have to enable it in the OLT and the service port needn't know about the commands. So a structure is created over there. Let me enable the service port so that the service can go to the OLT. Now, over here, the OLT, after a couple of seconds, will have this over here. It has been, the IP addressing has been configured in the WAN. And here it has IP v6 and the one we reached the first objective now look at this exercise 
I'm going to take this IP, which is from the ONT, and I'm going to go to the internet, and I'm going to do a test, a check. We're going to ping in the internet. If you have IPv6, so I'm going to ping from the internet to that ONT. So here we are, and that ONT already has internet. Now, I don't, uh, that's not useful for me. I want to have internet in the PC, not in the ONT. So there's one step missing. I have to go to the prefix delegation. How do we configure the prefix delegation in a WAN? because you will see something that has to do with routing. These are the commands of the DHCP. Basically, I have to create a pool, and the concept is to create a pool, which is this one over here. Here we have the slash 48, and I say, you're going to take this from this slash 48, you're going to have a slash 56. I'm going to sign this, you sign this with a lifetime, etc. And after that, in VLAN 266, I enable that delegation. I simply am going to go to the interface and run this over here. So I go to interface 266 to VLAN 266 and I run this command. So there I enable. One VLAN 266, and there you have this output. Now, look at this over here at this prefix 28037210 FF68. Now, let's see what happens with the ONT. Just a couple of seconds, and let's see if we reach the receive the delegated prefix. This one is not as fast. And we should receive now the delegated prefix. DHCP v6 pool a couple of seconds, and the ONT should have received the pool. Let's check in the OLT. Play MAC address. We don't see, know if we're seeing it in the OLT. There it is. So it should reach here now. Let's look at the parameters over here, and six, and apply. Let's check. Here it is. So this is the one, and now I received a prefix. If you pay attention, this is the first prefix of the block. It's this one over here. That's a slash 56. So I think you all can view it. Now, that is useless. I have to announce it through the LAN because the concept is that from that prefix, a slash 64 is taken and taken downstream so that the PC that is behind the CPE then takes one of those prefixes, specifically the third prefix, he corrects himself, the fourth one. And we, let's see what happens. The PC we have behind I think that, well, it already received the prefix. This over here is the fourth slash 64. And look, 
at the relationship between the slash 64 prefix that the PC took and the mask that we have over here. So look at the PC and this is the addressing. So if I go to the PC and I have a V6 and I have connectivity, but I won't have that in fact. And let me explain why. I don't yet have IPv6. Why is this so? This is very important. Let's go over this again. I told the one, I gave the prefix to the CPE, also solved. The CPE included the fourth slash six for the PC, got the IP. All this is fine, but something is missing. This prefix over here has not been routed. So it turns out that the DHCP server of the Huawei doesn't do routing of this prefix. This shows that if I deliver a prefix and I don't do routing, there is no internet. So that's one of the things that I want you to take home as a message. So how do we solve this? There is a trick. The trick is the following. I'm going to going to download the DHCP, the VLAN. And I said, uh, I'm going to say, display the DHCP. And what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to do a relay. In other words, I'm going to tell the Huawei or the access router that when it receives a DHCP request, when the Huawei receives a DHCP request over here, that request then creates a relay to someone who is over here, which is a microtick. Because it turns out that Huawei, when it does relay, it does the routing, and microtick too. Microtick does routing when it does delegation, but that's not the case for Huawei. Let me show you. Let's do the relay. Now, with this aim, we have to come over here. This is for relay. So I'm going to say do relay and then it does the routing. I apply the commands rapidly. So basically I said do relay to this IP and do the routing of this one over here. And this is the MitroTik we have over here. Let me restart the ONT. So it then applies this and does the delegation once again. So while I explain this, let me restart this. So save and restart. In the Microtik, this is a good delegation system which works perfectly well. But basically, it does a pool over here. It's very simple. You have IPv6 pool over here, and the prefix is defined, the same slash 48, and it's going to deliver slash 46 or slash 56. And then you define options, the DNS. Here you have this in hexadecimal. You can include the domain, and you have the hexadecimal here. You can also do NTP and put the hexadecimal. And simply, you tell the interface to the service. You can be do just anyone, and you indicate the pool. Lo que ocurre. So what happens then is that the ONT requests the prefix to Huawei, and Huawei sends this to the Microtik. So Microtik sends the prefix to Huawei, Huawei sends the prefix to the ONT, and in turn, it routes it. Let's look at it. Let's see the ONT. Let's uh, give enter. Let's see the prefix. Let's see the status. 
It must have obtained the same prefix, but now there is a difference. If I go to Huawei and I tell display IP6 routing table, you realize that here there's a prefix. This route here is uh, the on our uh, route is the prefix route. That is called delegated prefix routing. Without that, that there's no delegation. Now the PC is behind. You'll see that now it has internet. Do you see it? Now it has internet. So now I can pin Google. 2001, it's a famous 888, and we managed, we succeeded. Look at everything we had to do. We had to mount an RA to give an IP to the one of the CPE or DHCP2. If we have lobbying and state, we mounted a server to give a prefix. We took a slash 64, we did RA here with the HCP. We did a relay here. We mounted a D DHCP in Microtech, or it may be another Huawei, and Huawei and routed it. Oh, that's what you have to do for this PC to have internet, and that is how we managed. We succeeded uh, with our objective. So here I will. Uh, give, Alejandro, I guess there's a part for where you can download this material. It's all in all the commands in Huawei, and you have the commands in Microtech to create the delegation, the hexadecimal. And if not, I will send you a website. This is going to be a public information for all uh, the participants to this event. Now, recommendations. I'm closing. Recommendations. You must understand. Well, the baseline recommendation is to start uh, to in depth uh, the de implementation of IPv6. And if you have a GPON network, they work very well with uh, uh, IPv6. All the contents are already available in IPv6. The second recommendation is to uh, demos and practice and pilot uh, test, uh, understand uh, what you're doing well, the command, the uh, uh, machine, you'll understand that as you go, but understand the processes that you need to, to deploy to reach your goal. That is that the PC, uh, uh, not, it, there's no need for it to be a PC. Any device may have um, IPv6. That's the objective. Define what you have to do, what the, um, the machine will be, when, how, and then you have a specific um, uh, specifications. Remember that for each uh, VLAN you'll need a DHCP6 of get started. Alejandro, I think that with that, basically, that would be it. I don't know whether you have any questions. Well, first of all, Jose, thank you for the presentation. Yes, indeed, here we have quite a few questions. I think there are three questions. This is a Zoom question. If anybody in the room wants to ask something, let me know, and we'll have one of each. So let me start with Zoom. Elias Mayorga, he asks, how would you structure in the PD PD, if you need to give a specific routing as segmenting networks at home with the new applications that uh, get reach the host. For instance, we need a slash 56 to a business uh, client. Well, let me see, check. If behind the ONT there's a network that starts with um, very simply, but that network needs to evolve until it's routed, for instance, maybe with uh, a more, there's no problem with the CPE, you can do it, and with the same slash 56, if that was defined as the delegation receiving the CP, 
that's 256 slash 64 from the beginning that should suffice for a medium sized network that is why I suggest delivering a, a slash 52 or, or a slash 48 so that the client may have a, um, a network as large as it wants so and, and this can be extrapolated so for each device um, so this is absolutely possible to g deliver a slash 48 the network of the client may grow as much as you can and there's no need for you to give them a, an additional slash 56 if in that ONT there is if it uh, provides services to two clients then it's um, you can separate by type of clients by VLAN by type of service and each will deliver the size of the pre six that they need not all the delegators need to give a slash 56 some can give a slash 60 slash 52 or slash 48 never less than slash 60. so with one single prefix that the ONT receives that should suffice i hope i understood your question right yes i think that that is uh, the way you should interpret it elias so please feel free to ask it again elias if uh, that was not what you asked jose gregorio any more questions to jose gregorio Cultura? this is the first time that during a lacnic course we are giving uh, ipv6 and uh, gpon uh, 10 uh, gpon uh, this is so important to have a uh, uh, Jose Henry Godoy through Zoom says very good presentation Jose now I have a question as a result of the difficulty in implementing a CLAT daemon in the CPE what would be another topology uh, another in the Gibon uh, topology to implement there? well let's remember that in the 464 in CLAT CLAT goes in the device there are two places where CLAT could go in the uh, final uh, device of the client to reach IPv4 when it's uh, IPv6 only, or it can be in the CPE also to go from the CPE being NAT64 or, yes, with traffic that comes from IPv4 in the CPE. And then through the plat, it should go to an IPv4 network and CLAP could go in, in the CPE and with no problems. Now, it's the support, uh, the ONT so far, I haven't seen them a significant support with CLAT. I think that the race will be won by the native IPv6 implementation, because remember that CLAT is needed with IPv6 only, needs to go to an IPv4 site and does not have an IPv4 version of origin. So it is there that you need CLAT. But for some reason, the vendors of CPEs have uh, taken a long time for to, to do that this would be an excellent solution but apparently this is my view that they are playing they so that those that are not in ipv6 yet but are using ipv4 and need a clad will end up uh, buying an ipv6 and if a destination is an ipv6 then a clad will not be needed so yes the cpe may work with no problems and then it might run with no problems remember that glad is an app that goes in a, in a device that has ipv6 only and glad fools it and generates an ipv4 version so that it will believe that it is generating ipv4 traffic it goes through an ipv6 and then it ends up with ipv4 but that's a transition actually because when that device that is in ipv4 only moves to ipv6 that need 
for connection going through the cloud is no longer required. For instance, Skype. Skype didn't have IPv6 support. With CLAD, we could read with an IPv6 only version, and then, and then, uh, when you we got them, people were no longer using Skype. Henry, I think that we've seen in some of the courses. I send you a big hug. Thank you, Jose. Thank you for your answer, and thank you, Henry, for your question. Is there a question here in the room? Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. That was a very good presentation. I'm Neri Machado of Local Net Paraguay. I just wanted to ask something very specific. Today, in dual stack, we're delegating prefixes through the PPPOE concentrator activating slag in the CPE. In this case, as we delegate the prefix to the OLT, what would what we win with that? I understand. Yes, if I, if I understood, you would be using a scheme of PPPOE for the configuration of the CPE. And on that PPOE scheme, you would have the delegation. Is that the question? Could you check? Could you tell me whether that's your question? No, no. Oh, delegation when there's a PPOE. Yes. Well, the PPPOE is the way we encapsulate the data from the CPE to the IP network. And the delegation is a mechanism to add prefixes. They may go hand in hand. That's no problem. If you use IP uh, with no PPPOE, the delegated will work the same. There's a server, there's a client, and the transportation is PPPOE or IPOE. Really, there is no gain in terms of the delegation. The CPE, in the end, will receive the delegated prefix and will place, make it available to the LAN network of the client, whether it's PPPOE or IP directly. Using the PPPOE will have uh, some explanations of uh, help for management of the client, but because it comes from a paid user, of course, maybe the, the client will benefit of going on with the same trend. So you can work with or without PPPOE. There is no, the, the things don't get better if it's a PPPOE. I think there was one more question here in the room. One more question, then a remote one, and then we would close the session because we've run out of time. I'm Valeria Slavkovsky from Dominican Republic. My question is, what other software or solution in addition to Microtech can I use as a server for IPv6? That's a question. That's a good question. Fortunately, I would say that after the RA concept, the protocol that has the greatest support should be DHCP v6. We can't do without it. It's essential. So what I mean is that all the founder focusing to an access and network, probably with a border router, uh, you won't find that support. But all routers for access or all machines with the VNT capacities has support. Microtech has it, Huawei too, and even the Linux servers, there's a daemon, and several daemons and applications that do delegation very well. Cisco, of course, Fortinet, 
R5. All these have support for delegation. This is fundamental. You cannot even understand the IPv6 G porn unless you have a device that has prefix delegation. And I dare to say that any device that you're going to use for access has support even for the most simple of delegations. And also for practice purposes, you can set up a virtual machine. You put Linux and Microtik, and you can do this very well. So this is widely supported, both for DHCP v6 and DHCP v6 and don't worry about that because that support is available and they all have support you shouldn't have any issues there now support as sophisticated transition mechanisms in that case these are not available but in the case of DHCP this is available in all Jose, uh, thank you very, very much. We have one final online question before we close. And can you summarize this in less than 90 seconds? Fabian Alvarado would like to know if the OLT is not transparent, if it has IP1 towards the writer and IP1 to the ONU, are there any problems there? That's a good question. And in fact, the OLT all the OLTs, at least the one that I know, Nokia and Calix and I don't know, these are the most important ones. They all have the possibility that the OLT works in a non-transparent mode, in other words, routed. And when we have done routing, performance drops. So <coughs> now, To answer the question, there is no point, no problem here. If the OLT works in routing mode, all the features are enabled for layer 3 and IPE6. From the five I mentioned, all have this. They have RA. They have this for the CPE and DHCP. And they also have relay. And they do relay. And when they do relay, the so they are prepared to work as if it were a router and even when they go to layer 3 they have uh, EVGP they don't support too many routes I, I don't recommend it because of their performance because I won't handle the same traffic as I would do with layer 2 however I have worked on projects where because of specific issues they put uh, an OT in routing and they do an impeccable job so you'll need to route it but the answer is there are no problems. Uh, so an applause for Jose. And now Sandra will close. Actually, I want a round of applause for Ale and Wesley, Jose, again, because it's always a pleasure to listen to them. And